Hello and welcome to Politics War Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt. Thanks for joining us. Remember, we take your questions each episode, so write into politicswarroom at gmail.com or send a tweet to at Politicon for next week's show. We'll get to as many as we can. Don't forget to tell us where you're from. Please check out the links to our sponsors in the show notes. We thank you for supporting our sponsors. It really helps to make this podcast happen. Please tell your friends about us and remind them to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. James, uh, this was a sad week. It was a sad 10 days, two more mass murders. We've seen this movie so many times before. Sandy Hook, Caliban, Virginia Tech. People are horrified. They're outraged. They say we have to do something about it. And nothing happens. And my great suspicion, fear, worry is that'll be the same this time. You know, sometimes we've done little things after Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King were killed. We enacted some minor gun control bills. The 94 crime bill enacted some assault weapons ban, which had a, a, a modest impact for about 10 years, and then it ended. But basically, we just continue as is. And um, I don't know what it takes, but I'm afraid these two tragedies isn't going to change a thing, and that's really depressing. Yeah, assault weapon ban, I mean, I think mass murders went down like almost 20 percent, which if you're at 20 percent, it's a little more important than it looks like. And, of course, we got rid of it. I, I, I kind of share the same thing everybody else does. I, I, how many times do we go to this movie? I mean, how many people do we interview and how many people do we say, you know, he bought the gun, the FBI knew about the guy, he bought the gun, same thing happened in Georgia. And, you know, again, the corruption is just staggering in this country and they're not going to hold gun manufacturers liable. They're, they're not going to do, maybe they'll get some essentially minor thing through. But it's just very difficult for me to watch this because I just can't imagine what something like that would have happened to one of my children. But nothing's going to change. It's just until we, till we, there's something, some fix we need in this system, and we don't have it yet. And I don't know when we're going to get it. Well, this is, as Ron Brownstein says, I think in many ways this is cultural. It's just trying to persuade... I, you, 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 I, I am convinced it's not just the money and the corruption. I mean, that's there. But there are a lot of people out there, a lot of Trump people, but other people, too, who really have come to accept the total lie that gun control means taking away your ability to hunt, taking away your ability to protect your home. That's bogus. That's just untrue. You don't bag Bambi with an AK-47. Uh, but that's the perception. And uh, I don't know how you change that perception. Uh, nothing, nothing has so far, and I hope I'm wrong this time because these are ha as horrific as all the others. But uh, it's, it's. I think whatever the numbers tell you on gun control, once you start doing it, you find the intensity among those people who say it's, it's just a whatever cliche they use. The, you know, the the start of uh, gun confiscation, uh, it kicks in. Yeah, well, I mean, what's going to happen is that everybody's obsessed on this story and, you know, everything on the, in the press and cable TV and every columnist, the number of columns today, what we need to do about gun control. And what we know is going to happen in four or five days, something different will happen and everybody will forget about it. And I, I, I wish I had a more optimistic point to, to share with our uh, listeners here, but I'm, and I, I hope I'm being unnecessarily and overly pessimistic, but I have to say I'm pessimistic. Yeah, me too. Uh, and I think Joe Biden must be too. He's been fighting this battle now for you know, yeah, 40 years. The 94 crime bill, what they had to do to get the assault weapons ban is to get John Casey can get all these votes for it. They had to give up something on mandatory sentencing. It's like anything else. Of course, no one goes back and forget all of that. It's just not I, I hope I'm wrong. Somebody, some young activist out there, some change agent, somebody, please prove me wrong that they're going to do something about well, this. Well, you know, not. there have been some, some really uh, deep pocket activists. Michael Bloomberg has done an awful lot of stuff with some very good people. Gabby Giffords is out there and nothing. Right. And, and by the way, so Michael Bloomberg sticks wrong. his hand in his pocket. Okay, he just doesn't have a deep pocket. He sticks his hand in the pocket and pulls money out and gives it to this. And, it, you know, it doesn't, I, 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 I hate to be like this, 
because, you know, the, the James Carville brand is generally optimism. Let's go get them. Let's fight them. We'll get them in the mountains and the valleys and the shores and the rivers and everything. But I don't think this shit's going to change anything. Anything else that strikes you this week, James? I mean, that's the whole immigration thing. It, it strikes me. Uh, you know, the, the, what's going on with, uh, what, what, I guess, the, uh, I don't want to call it the stimulus bill, but the, the financial aid stuff that we send to people uh, strikes me. I mean, it, it's, it's full of stuff out there, uh, challenges. But, I mean, I think for the most part, uh, Biden is doing pretty good. I mean, he should not run up airplane steps, and I don't do that. I'm more terrified than steps than me I too. am of anything in the world. And it just doesn't mean that you, you're not mentally sharp. But... Uh, and, and you know it's a, it's the same stuff. You know the, the Fox people are going nuts. The, the, you know MSNBC is trying to find its footing, and CNN, and you know it's just it, it's just life continues to churn. And but I, you know, I think things are, are better. But in terms of like the corruption and the way that the, the Washington is run by. These interest groups, I, I, I hope I'm wrong. Maybe we'll get Fred Wertheimer's House Bill 1 and something will make a difference, but I'm, I'm not pessimistic. Well, that sure would make a difference. You know, um, this is a long, long time ago in the 80s. Uh, I, I took all my kids up to see the Capitol, up to see the Congress, up to see the, the Senate, because I thought it was such a majestic place. Uh, I even took my two-month-old, my first one two-month-old, when there was a Saturday session, because I thought, it would, you know, he obviously wouldn't remember it. I have a three-year-old grandchild, James. I got a whole bucket list of things I want to do with him when this pandemic is over. You know, going to see the United States Senate ain't one of them. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, it's always easy to say things aren't the way they used to be. There were imperfections, you know, 30, 40 years ago, but man, it's gotten a lot worse. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, in 74, and we, we, we you know, I, I, at some level, you can almost hear people saying they're giving up. This is the system we live in. We'll do, we, obviously, Biden is 6,000 times better than Trump. But, you know, and of course, the Colorado stuff, the Atlanta stuff, we, we all get appropriately, for good reason, really gassed up. And But I think at the end of the day, and I hate to say this, we all know where we're going to be a month from now, and that is where we were a month ago. I hope I'm wrong. Somebody to please, please call it, you know, write us a letter on Muscle Now and say, James, you made a fool of yourself. Real changes come to America. Well, and, and do it this week, and, and I'll make one commitment. Somehow, we're going to be more upbeat next week. We may have to reach. We may have <laughs> you know, to stretch. I, I don't want to be upbeat. We're going to find when, some way to be more right, upbeat. I don't want to be upbeat when people are getting shot. By, by, no, I don't want to be upbeat bullshit, about that, but there are some, you know, there are some good things. We're going to reduce poverty, child poverty, by 50% in this country. That's, a, that's an awful lot of uh, good things in that bill, and we'll uh, you know, we can Pinker talk about he'll that. He'll tell me why I shouldn't be depressed. Okay, <laughs> okay. I will. I'm all for it. I all don't right, want to guys. be this way. I don't want to be this way. It's not me. It's not my general outlook on life. It's about, uh, we talked on the show a couple of times and actually talked in in, in, in private conversations a couple of times about Fundrise, which is a very intriguing, I guess you'd call it a product, an idea. Why don't you tell our listeners again exactly what Fundrise is and why we're so enamored with this particular concept? Well, it's a really interesting company. It's spelled F-U-N-D-R-I-S-E for our listeners, and we should all be using it because in 2021, a truly diversified portfolio, it needs more than the traditional mix of stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. It needs private real estate. Studies have shown that portfolios with an allocation of private real estate generally delivered a better risk-adjusted return with more annual income and lower volatility over the past two decades thanks to its track record of consistent performance through multiple market cycles. With Fundrise, again, that's F-U-N-D-R-I-S-E, this level of powerful diversification is available to you now. Fundrise provides access to diversified portfolios of private real estate to all investors with their industry leaders, and it's an easy-to-use platform. And whether you're looking to add stable cash flow via dividends or prefer long-term growth through appreciation, Fundrise makes investing in private real estate as easy as investing in stocks, bonds, or mutual funds. 
Fundrise's team of real estate professionals carefully vets and actively manages all of their real estate projects. And with their easy to use website, if you can track your portfolio's performance and you can watch as properties across the country are acquired, improved, and operated via dynamic asset updates. See for yourself how 130,000 investors, James, listen to that, 130,000 investors have built a better portfolio with private real estate. Just takes a few minutes to get started. Go to fundrise.com slash warroom. That's fundrise.com slash warroom and look for our link in our show notes. Yeah, that, that whole real estate thing looks like a, like a high-end poker game. And what Fundrise does, it actually lets the shoe clerks in the poker game which doesn't happen very often. It, it gives the average Joe a, a chance to participate in what, as they point out, has been a historically uh, profitable investment. So I, I think it's a great idea, you know, great idea. Yeah, it is, including market challenge people like you and me. Hey, the most gifted political journalist in America, the Atlantic's Ron Brownstein, uh, is out with a new book and he's showing his extraordinary versatility. It's called Rock Me on the Water. It's how in the early 1970s, particularly 1974, there was this great seminal change in the entertainment industry and in politics. And there's some connection between the two. Uh, Ron, tell us what transformed uh, these two politics and, and movies and television and music, and what's the connection? Well, first of all, thanks for the kind words, Al. James, thanks for having me to talk about uh, the book. Uh, you know, Rock Me on the Water is about the uh, incredible constellation of talent that came together in LA uh, in the early 1970s that simultaneously transformed the movie, the music, and television uh, industry. I mean, first of all, it just must have been an amazing amount of fun to have been there then. We're talking about Joni Mitchell and Linda Ronstadt and Jackson Brown and the Eagles and music, uh, Norman Lear and Carol O'Connor, James L. Brooks and Mary Tyler Moore, Larry Gelbart and Alan Alda on television uh, and in movies, uh, not only stars like Beatty and Nicholson and Jane Fonda, but two generations of great directors simultaneously producing really top-notch work. The, the people born in the 20s and 30s, like Alan Bakula and Arthur Penn and Bob Rafelson and Robert Altman, and the first real impact of what were called the movie brats, right? The, the, the generation born in the 40s, uh, Spielberg and Lucas and Scorsese, uh, Paul Schrader. And so at one level, this was just a moment of just a tremendous uh, 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 outpouring of pop culture mastery and innovation. But it was also, I believe, a cultural, social, and political hinge point because it was in the great pop culture produced in the early 1970s that the 60s critique of American life was truly cemented into our culture. Ideas like greater suspicion of authority, greater suspicion of government and business, uh, changing relations between men and women, more personal freedom, more inclusion of uh, marginalized groups. Uh, all of the, you know, Nixon won two elections in 68 and 72 by mobilizing the voters who were most unnerved by, uneasy about the way the, the, the changes of the 60s had unleashed on American society. But I believe that the integration of all of the triumph of all of those ideas in the pop culture of the era really forecast their eventual triumph in our society. Uh, and, in, and, and, and in that way, I think there's a lot of parallel to where we are today, where the cultural changes, the culture is probably ahead of the politics in predicting what America is going to look like. Ron, to stick with 1973, four, whenever, I mean, the, the parallels, All in the Family with Archie Bunker, that great Norman Lear production, and the Hard Hat Rebellion, McGovern versus Nixon, or Chinatown, one of my favorite movies, Corruption, Campaign Finance, and Watergate. Uh, I mean, you really do, I've, I, you really have drawn uh, analogies uh, between the body politic and entertainment in that time. Right. And they, you know, they don't always, they don't always move together in phase, right? I mean, I would argue the culture is usually ahead of the politics because both in 68 and 72, Nixon's silent majority was centered on the voters, much like Trump's uh, coalition, who uh, Nixon's coalition was centered on the voters who were most uneasy about the way America uh, was changing and what they were seeing reflected uh, in, in the pop culture. Uh, but 
the, the, those ideas that you know that that, that we that we should be li- you know that we could that we could and should be living differently in our daily lives and in, in the role of women uh, in the way um, uh, that we uh, the kind of the personal freedoms that people enjoy the way we looked at the big institutions in society whether we trusted them all of those ideas were advancing all in the family was you know it, it kind of condensed the generation gap into a single living room right I mean it, it took all the conflicts of the 60s and enclosed you in this one living room where they were being fought out and as you know Al um, TV before that didn't do that. I mean, the TV in the 60s was about taking your mind, you know, erasing uh, the, uh, everything that was happening around it. All in the family really connected the medium to yeah, the Yeah, and moment. as you wrote, he uh, had, and, a, and he a, had a lot a, of great things flow through that hole. He, he had a hard time getting that on. Uh, thank goodness it did. You know, also the music. Uh, you, you write particularly, uh, I think, a particularly interesting chapter you do on Linda Ronstadt and Jackson Brown. The title of your book is actually taken from a Brown album. And you have a wonderful description there uh, of LA and I guess circa 1974, where uh, there would be nights where marquee names were strumming and singing together around a pool under the California uh, stars. I mean, it just seems like a magical time. It, you know, look, I mean, you know, as I say, as I said, at one level, uh, this was a confluence of talent that I don't think has gotten its due. I mean, you will understandably talk about the literary world in Paris in the 20s or the modern art world in the early 1950s. But this was just a few blocks away from each other. Uh, the people who were making Chinatown and The Godfather and Carnal Knowledge and Five Easy Pieces and Shampoo and Nashville and then ultimately Jaws and Taxi Driver uh, and, and Star Wars. Uh, oh, I guess I guess Lucas was, was living in San Francisco. And then at the same time, you had this just incredible constellation of musical talent, Joni Mitchell, Jackson Brown, Linda Ronstadt, uh, the Eagles, uh, and then, you know, the TV, Mary Tyler Moore, MASH, all in the family. All of this was happening within blocks of each other at the same time. And yeah, people, Graham Nash, would, you know, among others would say to me, if you went to a party on Saturday night, you would bring your guitar, you know? And uh, uh, in fact, it is a few years earlier, but when Joni Mitchell was first brought to LA by David Crosby, uh, before she had a record contract, he kind of drummed up interest by having her play at people's parties, you know, people's houses a little bit, to do a few songs. And somebody said to me, you know, the next day I thought I hallucinated her, you know, because she was so talented and so beautiful uh, and just so, so riveting. Um, and so I, I, when I was researching this book, I, you know, during the very tumultuous Trump years and then, and then ultimately finishing it in the pandemic year, there were definitely moments where I wish I could have just kind of, you know, stepped into the hot tub time machine and come out at Linda Ronstadt's house in the Malibu colony in 1974 because it seemed like a very good place to spend wish you would have taken us with you if you did james yeah uh brian uh, we had uh jane fonda on the show and she was predictably charming nice insightful but 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 i'll read about your book and all of the people you know and linda ronstead and jackson brown shit jane fonda defined hollywood for good or bad i mean yep and so we did produce this very creative outburst and I think very necessary, but it has produced a reaction that exists today. Mm-hmm. So talk yep. a little bit about how Jane was kind of a, I mean, she was the lead, she was the lead horse on this. And, right. Yeah. So I, I think, James, I think that the, the common, if there is a common thread through the movies, music, and television of the era, uh, it is what of the ideals of the 60s could be preserved and made relevant in the stonier political soil and more difficult economic and cultural environment of the 70s. I think that was the core issue that you are seeing grapple with in everything from Chinatown to All in the Family to Mary Tyler Moore to Rock Me on the Water. And, you know, Fonda and her eventual husband, Tom Hayden, in many ways are like a more extreme version of what these artists were grappling with because they went further out on the ledge in the 60s. You know, I mean, uh, I have uh, 1974, which is, you know, the book takes place month by month through 1974. I believe 1974 was the moment that Jane Fonda came in from the cold. Okay, where 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 uh, in the early 70s, in her most radical moments, 
uh, her alienation from America was so deep and her desire to be seen as credible, despite all of her privileges and advantages on the left, was so profound that she was, in her own words, kind of spiraling out of control. I mean, she was in a bad way. Um, I talk a lot in the book about how she ended up in Hanoi on a gun um, and how she ended up criticizing the POWs when they came back uh, the next year. Um, But by 1974, um, both her and Hayden, and I think in this way emblematic of, you know, many of those who are kind of the forefront of protests in the 60s, and they kind of understand there's not going to be a fundamental revolution. We're not re- reconfiguring American society. And the question is, how do you find a useful way to contribute and participate? And as I talk about in the book, for her, that 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 unfolded along two tracks. I mean, uh, Hayden and Fonda lead their Indochina peace campaign into much more conventional political organizing and activism than they had ever done before. They would have scoffed at before. And also she takes the first steps toward reentering Hollywood, right, with fun with Dick and Jane, which is kind of a you know, light, uh, not a major artistic statement, but one that showed that the movie theaters, as they said, were not going to be burned down if she was there. And that eventually led to coming home and on Golden Pond and everything else, kind of, you know, the Jane Fonda that we that we know and, and so many, you know, uh, respect and admire today. And I really think 74 uh, is the turning point for her, where she she goes from kind of spiraling toward greater alienation and greater distance toward re-entering the mainstream of American life without surrendering ideals, just finding different ways uh, to kind of uh, implement and, and express them. And that, I think, is the fundamental story of the pop culture of, of the early 70s. I mean, and, and, and you see it wrestle with and shampoo in shampoo in many of the great albums uh, of that era. Uh, and and uh, obviously on shows like All in the Family, MASH, Mary Tyler Moore. You know, how do we, you know, we're not going to have a revolution. Okay, but does that mean that none of the way that we uh, criticize American society is going to take root? And, and that's what and that's what really what was fought out in the pop culture. So I was preparing of the era. for the show this morning, but of course I read New York Times like every, every good liberal does, and of course Tom Metzl's every Wednesday, so I, I don't miss his column under any yeah. circumstances. And it was about polarization, and he you know he emailed fifteen political scientists. And I couldn't help but think that there was a connection to Tom's column in your book, that the cultural differences that have become so hardwired in America, I I think you can say that the 70s in in Southern California were were really, and for for better and worse, nothing is all good. And I agree with 80% of what, you know, came out of that. But... They also did produce a, a, a shitload of resentment, cultural alienation, everything else. Do you see a connection yep. between Tom's column in the late 70s in, in Los Angeles, that it was so culturally no, no, absolutely. Look, absolutely. I, I believe that the reason we are so polarized uh, above all, I mean, there are lots of reasons, but the biggest single reason our politics are so polarized and so antagonistic is that we have gone from a class-based to a culture-based political alignment, that the glue that holding the parties together are your cultural attitudes, whether you welcome or fear the way America is changing demographically, culturally, and even economically. Uh, this is not, you know, uh, and that is a change that has its roots in the 60s. I mean, you know, in the Roosevelt era, the, the dividing line in American politics was class uh, in the in the decades of the New Deal coalition from the 30s to the 60s. Uh, and that begins to shift with the civil rights acts of the 60s, all of the uh, social turmoil and cultural upheavals of the 70s and 80s. And then uh, in the last, you know, in the, in the Trump era, with the racial component of that made more explicit and overt than ever, and thus dividing us uh, more clearly along those lines. So I do believe that the, the reason our politics is so intractable and combustible is because the parties are now separated by cultural attitudes more than more than class interests. And that goes back the beginning of that process. I mean, obviously, there have been other things that have happened that intensified it since. But the beginning of that process is everything that unfolded in the 60s, uh, whether it was policy or cultural change. You know, and as I talk about in the book, I mean, even as all of this is happening, Nixon is twice winning national elections by mobilizing the voters who dislike all of this the most. And shampoo is actually a very elegiac <laughs> 
uh, movie about that moment when, you know, beneath all the sexual hijinks and calisthenics that, that Beatty right. goes through in that in that movie with Lee Grant and Carrie Fisher and Julie Christie and Goldie Hawn, um, it is an elegiac moment about kind of realizing that, okay, the, the, the change is not, is not coming. Um, but yeah, the, the, the 60s was the beginning of the pivot from class to culture. And the pivot from class to culture, I believe, is the fundamental reason why we are so, so divided. So some political today. scientist said something that I've just been preaching the whole time. He says, actually, there is real coalescing around center-left issues, from progressive taxation to expanded health care to, to even Roe v. Wade to even immigration. All right? It, it, it's not, if, if we took the five biggest flashpoint issues in American politics, the Democrat, the center left side would win all five and it would not be close. All right. We won felons right to vote in Florida by 64%. We won the minimum wage of $15 by 15%. We don't win fucking elections. All right. Right. How, and, and you're a, an observer, all right. How does, how does, how, and, and I'm going through this with immigration right now everybody is completely frozen panicked we're caught it's a disaster there's nothing we can do it's all falling apart in, in, am i wrong or, or it's not the principles that we go to war what it is the way we go to war that causes us grief well i i, I think it I, I think it might be even even deeper than that like one of the things i am wondering in my political reporting is how much does performance count anymore? Like, is there, how many voters can you win over or lose by doing a really good job or a really bad job? And how much of the political um, alignment at this point is just based on a kind of a vision of identity that this party, you know, if you, if you are a Democrat, you are basically embracing a changing America that is growing more racially and religiously diverse, uh, that is more open to LGBTQ in all sorts of ways, uh, that uh, has different role for women. Um, and if you are a Republican, uh, you know, you are joining the side that feels that discrimination against whites is as big a problem as discrimination against minorities. 75% of Republicans say that. 90% of Trump voters in Henry Olson's polling say Christianity is under assault. Roughly three-fifths say immigrants are invading our country, that word, and, and replacing our culture. And, and so, like, it, it's almost, um, you know, you, you, you know, people talk about whether genetic, you know, whether these are character characteristics in your in your life that are that are genetic or nature or nurture, uh, you know, whether they can be shaped by your environment. I, I kind of fear that our politics is moving into a world in which actual performance is becoming almost more and more irrelevant. I won't say I won't say completely irrelevant, but like it's almost like we are conducting a census every two years of, you know, how many people fit on each side of this line because it has become such an expression of your vision of America. And, and there are so many ironies in this, not the least of which is that the older white America that is the most receptive audience for these Trump type claims that this is our country, to use his exact phrase, and they are trying to take it away from us. The, the older whites who are the you know, principal audience for that message, they need younger non-white America to succeed because those are the people who are going to pay the payroll taxes to fund their Social Security and Medicare. I mean, it isn't like, you know, in, in, I, think, I think in 46 of the 50 states, there are fewer white kids today than there were in the year 2000. I mean, the people who are going to fund the retirement of older white America that is kind of responding to this Trumpian argument that you are losing control, your America is being taken away, they, their, their retirement is being paid for you know, increasingly by younger non-white Americans who they want to make it harder to vote. They don't want to invest in education. They don't want to invest in their health care. I mean, that's well, just I'm going to turn crazy. over to Al, but I'm, I'm going to steal the idea, and there's uh, no Ron. patent, so I won't wait, give wait, you credit. Okay, I'm just telling you right now, I'm, admit, I'm admitting intellectual theft because it's such a good idea. And I call that the brown and the gray. By the way, I, I have written about this since 2010. You know, hey, Ron. Yeah. Well, yeah. Let me take you back to the book. Uh, Jerry okay. Brown. Uh, uh, Jerry Brown just burst on the political scene in the early 70s. He was different than anything California had ever seen before. I love this 
the description of El Adobe Restaurant, having gone there with him and having, rather than interviewing him, having him lecture me for an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. But talk about the Jerry Brown of 74 and then the Jerry Brown, who later became, I think, one of the great governors in the history of the state. Yeah, so Jerry Brown of 74 really is the political equivalent, Al, of, of, or the political parallel to uh, the um, directors and, and musicians and uh, TV folks that I, that I am writing about. Because he, and maybe along with Gary Hart to some extent the same year in Colorado, he really is the first kind of mainstream big office politician who starts bringing some of these ideas of the 60s into kind of the political uh, uh, landscape. He was a little older than the baby boom, but as his sister Kathleen pointed out to me, the three years he spent in a seminary kind of held him in suspended animation. So when he comes out, um, he is more exposed to the social movements of the 60s than he would have been uh, if he had just kind of gone through a normal career. He would have been further along in his life at that point and probably would not have been, uh, you know, uh, uh, volunteering with Cesar Chavez or uh, uh, campaigning for voting rights uh, in the South. Um, but in fact, he did have all those experiences and his kind of formative political experience was supporting uh, anti- an anti-war slate for the 68 convention, even as his father, Pat Brown, the former governor, was still all the way with LBJ. Um, so at the time Jerry Brown runs in 74, he's talking about limits. He's talking about environmentalism. He's talking about the need for a government that is more uh, open to women uh, and racial minorities. He's talking about a lot of the ideas that had gained ground uh, in the movements of the 60s. I mean, he's not Tom Hayden. Um, uh, He's not, you know, talking about uh, kind of revolutionizing society, but he is taking these ideas and finding the the, the kernel, the core in them that could be part of a mainstream uh, political campaign. Uh, And so, and then kind of the cherry on top for him is that he's running against the backdrop of Watergate. Uh, And he centers in 1974 running in a... uh, Democratic primary that, as I say, is kind of a political equivalent of all in the family. I mean, Jerry Brown, the young guy, uh, the Mike Stivic, uh, is running against Bob Moretti, the Speaker of the Assembly, and um, uh, 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 Alioto, Joseph Alioto, who is the mayor of San Francisco, older, you know, older than him, Hubert Humphrey Democrats, um, and they just do not know what to make of Jerry Brown. I mean, he just, they, they, they despise him. They think he's a dilettante. They think he's a, a grandstander, but he had his finger on something. The, the desire for generational change, the desire to clean up what was then really kind of a cesspool of Sacramento. Um, and against the backdrop of Watergate, he just blows them away in June, 1974, two weeks before Chinatown comes out. I mean, it's it, it literally is, all of these things converging uh, at the same time. And then, you know, he, he wins the governorship. And as I say, Brown kind of embodied the best and the worst of the baby boomers. I mean, he was brilliant. He was able to reconceptualize things. He wasn't trapped in all ways of thinking, but boy, he had trouble focusing at the beginning after he got elected. Yeah, he did, Ron, until he got elected the second time. Yeah, which was, you know, many, what, 2010, so. Yeah, and then he, uh, and then he became more like his dad, but. He did, um, you know, he was, he was governor I mean, like literally he was governor, you know, he succeeded Ronald Reagan as governor. And then he was governor again, what would it be, as late as 43 years after that? I mean, it's extraordinary. I mean, just, just you know, an extraordinary mind. Uh, he, he, you know, he was kind of knocked around by life. He lost a Senate race, uh, you know, ran for president. James will remember a, a, your I, candidate I almost physically well, decked him. In well, Illinois somebody tonight. on this podcast has actually beaten Jerry Brown. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't know you yeah. ran, James. Uh, Ron, let me ask you a final question. I used to go back in 1973, 4, I watched all of those television shows you write about, all in the family and MASH. Uh, and I mean, I Mary just Tyler thought they Moore. were Mary, Mary Tyler Moore. I mean, James Brooks and Gene Reynolds and Norman Lear. Mm-hmm. I don't watch any television shows. Is that just a sign of my age or is it just that they don't have shows like that on anymore? Well, I think, uh, no, I actually think the TV has recovered and, and, and you know, you, there are a lot of shows uh, more in kind of the streaming world and there's some, there's somewhere between like the TV shows we think of as, as episodic TV, like a, like an All in the Family or later Friends and Seinfeld and, and, and the miniseries. I mean, in some ways they're more like the miniseries boom of the 70s for which Barry Diller, I guess, is, uh, can, can, can claim a, a lot of the credit. Um, but yeah, no, I think, I think TV is again, 
um, shining a light, sees itself as a way of commenting on the society. And that's what I believe, as I say in the book, that's what I believe All in the Family really was the turning point. Because in the 60s, uh, you know, Walter Cronkite would spend half an hour uh, you know, shining a light on all the fissures in American life. And then the CBS would spend three and a half hours after that, giving you the Beverly Hillbillies and Petticoat Junction and Green Acres and Gomer Pop, basically trying to erase any knowledge of any of that from your mind. But oddly enough, Robert Wood, who came out of KNXT here in LA, was a USC graduate, a football booster, a conservative, a Nixon fan, a Reagan fan. When he became president of CBS, he realized that they were at risk of losing the baby boom generation in part to uh, the edgier movies that Hollywood was starting to produce. And he was the guy who said we had to get current and, you know, started with Mary Tyler Moore. But the real punch in the wall through the wall four months later it was January 71. He puts All in the Family on the air. And I think All in the Family, Al, is what establishes the idea that TV can be a meaningful a, me, a medium to meaningfully comment on the society around it. That idea had really fallen away in the 60s, and it's kind of come and gone since. But I do think that, we, that, that All in the Family is the beginning, the first step on the road to the peak TV that we live with today. Thank you. Boy, it was fabulous. James. So, you know, Ronnie, it's, it's funny because 1974, I been out of Marine Corps and I just graduated from law school mm -hmm. and I was kind of entering politics and I remember Chinatown distinctly. What, what else did you do? I remember what was going on you know, about corruption and Jerry Brown and I like yep. exited politics at this point in my life. I have to tell you, politics is so much more corrupt in 2021 than it was in 1974. Mm -hmm. I mean, the corruption that has gone on has just been breathtaking. I'm breathtaking. At, at every level. And we need artists, I believe, like these artists were in 1974, to bring home art that just tells us how fucking corrupt this whole place is. The banks, the, the companies, the, the everything you can imagine, the Senate, the House, the committees, the staff. It's just endemic, staggering, breathtaking, awesome corruption. And I don't think anybody would, would, would deny that. Mm -hmm. So I think the challenge, though, here, here, here's here. here let, let me let me let me respond to that. I don't think you have to convince the country that's true. This really goes back to what you were saying before. Uh, you know, I think that, again, when Chinatown came out, it was described as Watergate with real water. And the, the message of Chinatown, uh, as Robert Town, the screenwriter, said to me, above all, was you don't know as much as you think you do. In fact, John Huston says that to Jack Nicholson in so many words at one point. That was a revolutionary idea then. I think over decades, um, th that is not a revolution. That, that is accepted wisdom in the American public. You don't need artists to convince the public that the, that the political system is corrupt in the same way that you don't have to convince the public that there should be background checks on, um, on, on gun sales, 90%, it's an incredible, incredible number. I think what we are running into, James, on what you describe, uh, both in terms of the corruption and the earlier issues, are the ways in which a constitution written for a small agricultural country in the, 1800, in the 1700s is um, uh, creaky and, uh, uh, and struggling to deal with the realities of this America uh, you know, in, in the year 2021. And uh, I think all of these issues that we're talking about are, are not so much a question of public sentiment uh, as they are of the structural limits of the, of the, of the um, uh, constitutional system, the way it's set up, especially when you've got this kind of realignment that we're, uh, you know, aligning along cultural values rather than class, which makes it very hard to compromise. And I We've talked about this before. I think the 2020s could be the most difficult decade for America since the 1850s um, uh, in many ways uh, because of these structural limits, but also, again, because in a culturally based political alignment, you, you know, what we see in pop culture today is a very different America than Trump's voters want to live in. And yet that is the America that is going to come more into focus each year through the coming decade. And I think the Trump coalition could begin more not less alienated as the decade goes on. And we saw January 6th, what that alienation can le lead to. I don't really know where it goes next, but I think it's more likely to increase the well, decrease. Well, my final point is this. If people were playing corruption in the final four, the score would be corruption 125 people 18. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. 
Well, my final thought is uh, buy and read Rock Me on the Water. Ron Bramstein has done it again. Uh, it, it, was, it, it, it wasn't hyperbole to say how good you are, Ron Brownstein. It's not. Uh, and say hi to your wife and stay safe out there. And hey, opening day next week. You, you coming back? I, I'm, not, I'm not coming back for opening day, but man, I hope I'm in a stadium this summer at some point. I don't know that we all are. I mean, we, we, kind of, we kind of deserve that after the year America has had. We sure do. I just got eight games for April. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow, that is, that is an optimist right there. We are ready. ready. We Far are ready. Man. All right. Great. Hey, uh, wonderful. Thank book. you guys for having me. Always great to be with you. Ron, you are terrific. Thank you so much. Okay, James, our favorite segment, you know, other than our great guest, got lots of good questions. We start. This is from Louis Sam in Louisiana, James. He says, as I see it, there's no firm limit on the number of immigrants that cross the southern border. This has given Republicans one of the few issues that will have traction with the voters. How should the Democrats respond to fix this problem? You know, I spent the better part of a morning working on this. Uh, the, the truth of the matter is, is this is a right wing cause issue to the extent that people are being told that they will come here and get let in. They obviously won't. We need to, and this is very complicated, we need to address the asylum rules we have, the rules for refugees. We've always taken asylum seekers with, with a good cause in the country. We understand the need for refugees. These are some of the truly most unfortunate people in, in, on the entire planet. Uh, but what, what I think the, the president has to do is just clearly come in and say, this is the problem, this is what we face with, this is what we can do to make it better. And I think that the response so far has been, everybody calls me and says, we got a big problem now on the border, James, with people getting killed. Well, the reason we're getting killed is I don't think we have, we, I think we have a potentially good, but unused response. And I, I, I think at some point the president or, or the vice president's gonna have to write, uh, uh, you know, an op-ed or, or, or throw a marker down here. But right now the administration, other than Jen Psaki trying to catch knives in press conferences, they don't have a response yet, and they need one. No, I largely agree, and they shouldn't get into a debate about whether it's a crisis or not. That just puts them on the defensive. That's a silly debate to have. I think Biden does have to be actively involved, probably has to go to Mexico. You know, 10 years ago, I don't forget the figure, 90% of migrants were coming from Mexico. Today, most of these people are coming from Guatemala, El Salvador, where they face murder, uh, gangs, uh, violence uh, at home. So it's really a tragic human story, particularly when you see these kids. But uh, I, 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 think that, that, um, I think that Biden has things he can do. I, think, I don't criticize the policy so much as, as uh, uh, it's not even the rhetoric, it's the, it's the posture. They, they've got to gotta convey more both compassion and strength at the same time. Our second question comes from Kathy in Santa Barbara. She said, if all the stars align, the Senate and House managed to pass H.R. 1, and boy, that is a big star to align, Kathy. Will the Supreme Court eventually toss it? You know, I don't think they'll toss national voting standards. Congress always has, has been able to set national uh, voting standards. These are for congressional elections. They don't affect state and local elections at all. Things, if, if, if provisions like the gerrymandering provision stays in, this right-wing court, Republican court, might throw that out. There may be some other things. But the, the, the basic voting rights parts of that bill, I think even this Supreme Court would have a hard time throwing out. You know, we do a Sunday call, and our friend Walter Dillon, the former Solicitor General Dean of Duke Law School, read the relevant constitutional provision. It, it would take some kind of jurisprudential gymnastics to say that Congress doesn't have the authority to do this because, it, it, as I recall, I can't look it up now, but the Constitution gives Congress great authority on congressional and federal elections. And I just think it's going to be really difficult for them to fool with that. Right. Congress sets minimum age requirements. The campaign finance laws are, are standard. You know, they clearly have that authority. Next, the next question, George, and, and from Malaysia, Penyang, Malaysia. Oh, wow. What uh, if Trump is? never Please, returns? On, I hope y'all get out of this mess. <laughs> I do you. too. If Trump never returns or disappears for good, what would MAGA world do? Would they promote uh, Junior to God Emperor? I, you know, I think MAGA world is in kind of disarray now, 
and they're in, in real disarray. And I think they're getting to be in more disarray because I think that the Fulton County DA is dead serious, as is the Manhattan DA, as is the New York AG. And I think that uh, General Garland is not letting any of this uh, 6 January stuff go. And I think as it continues to unfold, MAGA will be in even greater disarray. Now, you know, who picks up the pieces? I don't know, but there'll be a lot of people trying. But, I, you know, when Trump was leaving the office, there was great debate that he would stay strong, he would be there, he would have this following. It was, you know, unbelievable. And a couple of people said he's just going to kind of recede. Uh, the people that said he was going to kind of recede, I think, had been proven more right than wrong. Yeah. Um, he's clearly not a happy camper down there, thank goodness. He's got a lot to be unhappy about. The next question comes from Pam in Jordan, Minnesota. She lives in a suburb of Minneapolis, so this is in the wake of the George Floyd case, and she really wants to learn and more about the history of America when it comes to black lives. And she said, what books would you recommend? Uh, and I, I'm going to tell you, Pam, I, I won't pretend I have any real expertise here, but I remember years ago reading James Baldwin's Go Tell in the Mountain, reading the, uh, the, uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X uh, uh, and, uh, with George Haley. And I know a, a really good new book, which I have referred to for comms, Michelle Alexander uh, has written about the new Jam, Jim Crow and what incarceration has done, to particularly to black males in America. I'm sure there is a, a book that has a more historical sweep, but those are all be good starters. What do you think, James? I, I would, and I watched this about a month ago, and I, I read about it, and I, it's actually on YouTube or something. I would watch the debate between James Baldwin and William Buckley at the Oxford Union. And I got to tell you, when I started, I, you know, because, you know, Buckley was an erudite guy. Just great. Baldwin kicked the shit out of him. And it really, really gave you a kind of appreciation for the way the way it was back then in the 1960s. And, you know, it was a very Oxford Unionist kind of high, high-end stuff. But it's really worth taking a look. Uh you know, you you could, there's all kinds of really, you know, Harris Wofford of Kennedy and Kings wrote a really good, you know, civil rights, during, during the civil rights movement. One of my favorite films ever of any kind was recommended to us by friend George Stevens is Robert Drew's Crisis. It is really worth looking at that to see what the policy and politics was in the early 60s. It's about the desegregation of the University of Alabama, but it is more a, a, a lot more than just about that. And it, I think it would give you terrific insight into what policymakers were trying to go through dealing with this. But the Baldwin-Buckley debate, I, I, I was stunned at, at, I guess I always knew that James Baldwin was a very bright man. I, I didn't know that he was that effective. Um. I'm going to break our rules because Kevin has not told us where he's from, and we're not supposed to to ask questions he's if we boss we know where people are from. So, Kevin, when you if you want anything more, you got to tell us where you're from. <laughs> yes, well, James. Kevin's from Boston, any place I've ever been. Yeah, exactly. James, he wants he wants you to tell Grandpa Joe, as he calls him, that refusing to hire people who smoke weed is way too fucking years ago. Oh, and if he doesn't use the VT to bring him up to speed on this, he's fucking toast. I'm just quoting Kevin right, here I, now. Kevin, I'm not going to be Secretary of State because I couldn't pass the test. <laughs> <laughs> I admit it. <laughs> I think it's the did stupidest you, thing I've ever heard. Did you inhale? I think it's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I don't know how somebody let that get through. It's actually a legal product in, you know, a huge percent of the country. The, the game is over, man. I mean, right. it just it, it, it makes Biden, it just reminds people of how freaking old he is. And yeah, it's just exactly. stupid. I, you know, yeah, I agree with you, Kevin, you know. Why didn't someone stop it? I, I don't. Uh, I, I'd love to know why. I mean, it's not a huge thing, but it's just an, it's a particularly idiotic thing. It is. Philip 
in Munich, Germany, James, ask what other government officials besides the president are theoretically subject to impeachment? Is it possible to impeach senators, representatives, Supreme Court justices, or federal judges? Can state and local public officials be impeached? Uh, the federal impeachment provision applies to the president, the vice president, and all civil officers of the United States. That includes Supreme Court justices. It does not, however, include members of Congress uh, or members of the military. They have their own separate tribunal to deal with that. A member of Congress can be, can be sanctioned, can be expelled even, and they can be indicted. But the impeachment provision uh, really uh, pertains to uh, civil officials of the United States, and that does include the Supreme Court. But that enlightened me a little bit. I, I, I generally knew who it applied to, but not specifically, but now thanks to Al Hunt, I'm much more schooled on impeachment in the Constitution. Hey, hey, James, I'm looking for outrages about something new. I don't want to keep going back and living in the horrors of yesterday, but I got to make an exception. Sidney Powell, the, the con artist who with Rudy Giuliani tried to bring these ridiculous assertions of voter fraud uh, against, the no, no, against the November election, said this week, now, now she faces legal problems. And she, she said, look, she said, no one would really buy into what we were saying. Yes, yeah, Sidney, you're right. No one would, and they shouldn't because you were lying. It was the whole thing was a fraud. The election wasn't a fraud. You were a fraud. Rudy was a fraud. But, you know, we can hold her accountable. We can hold Giuliani accountable. But I want to make sure that we never forget and try to hold accountable Mitch McConnell, Kevin McCarthy, uh, Roy Blunt. I mean, these were people who, if they didn't embrace it, they enabled it. And uh, when you have 35 or 40 percent of Americans believe an out-and-out -out lie, that there was some kind of massive fraud in this election. It's because of people like that. You know, my outrage, but he's not worthy of an outrage, is Stuart Varney, who's a old bag of crap idiot, said on Fox Business or whatever he is, that the reason we have $3 gas is because of the Green New Deal. I mean, the stupidity of that is not worthy of comment. But as opposed to of outrage, I, I, I want to come in praise of Senator Bernie Sanders, I, Vermont, because Bernie Sanders said, you know, it's something I've felt for a long time. I'm not comfortable with Twitter banning Trump. And Bernie Sanders gave such cover to people like me who, who really don't like this idea that you take people, that you stop people from speaking, they can't come to the university, they can't be on the platform, they can't be on anything. And, you know, I, and Bernie is a, like I am, we're different, you know, it was a Jewish guy from Brooklyn, grew up urban, and I was a Cajun kid from South Louisiana and grew up rural. But at some level, Bernie Sanders and I have the same instinct when it comes to speech, and that is let everybody talk. And I, 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 I thank Senator Sanders because it's very hard when you're in this kind of environment to say that because you get slapped down, canceled, fired, anything else that happened. And I, I think the old, people, the old guys like me who love free speech, Senator Sanders gave us a lot of cover. So congratulations to Bernie Sanders. Uh, amen, James. And we can plug another podcast because he said it in Ezra Klein's podcast. New York Times, and it's worth a listen. Uh, Bernie really was, he was quite interesting, quite candid in that. Yeah, he, he, he is. And, and I, I, the other thing, I think that this is all a huge political loser for Democrats. I think the idea that the Smith Faculty Lounge runs the Democratic Party is hurting us all around the country. And I think people are starting to wake up to that and starting to understand that. And I, I, and I, Again, I, I just I, I thank Senator Sanders because he gives in, enormous credibility. I mean, he gives the kind of, if you will, if you were Catholic, he gives the imprimatur for those of us who are more on the free speech side of this debate. You know, when you have free time, James, you can't read or work on personal development. Let me tell you about the ultimate life hack for learning new things and getting ahead. It's an incredible app that solves the problem, and we highly recommend it. It's called Blinkist. Blinkist is really unique, and it works on your phone, your tablet, or your web browser. Blinkist takes the best key takeaways for busy and successful people like our listeners, collects them from thousands of nonfiction books, 
and condenses them down into just 15 minutes. And with this audio feature, Blinkist makes it easy to finish a book anywhere, anytime. You can start using what you learn right away. 12 million people are enjoying Blinkist's massive and growing library this moment. There's everything from self-help to business, health, and history, along with the latest titles from the bestseller list and the classic nonfiction titles you always meant to read, but you never had time to. Right, James? Yeah, and if I'm the classic guy that is curious, time-constrained, and lack concentration. If, if you have any of these, this curiosity, scheduling issues, you know, you don't have a lot of time to concentrate on something other way, this product is tailor-made for you. It is just really, really tailor-made for you. And they have some really good books uh, there. Two of the recent favorites are Sea Stories, My Life in Special Operations by William H. McRaven. It's Admiral McRaven and Untrumping America by Dan Pfeiffer. With Blinkist, you get unlimited access to read or listen to a massive library of condensed nonfiction books, all the books you want, and all for one low price. Right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash War Room, try it free for seven days, and save 25% off your new subscription. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash War Room, all one word, to start your free day, seven day trial. And also you'll save 25% off, but only when you sign up at blinkist.com slash war room. You also can look for the link in our show notes. Hey James, a return visit from our favorite uh, columnist and America's most prolific author, sports author, John Feinstein. John. Uh, this is our season, March Madness. It's great. It's great that it's back. I've loved the games. I especially have loved the upsets, the different brackets. The I think it really is something that America needed. But boy, the experts screwed up. The so-called vaunted committee. They got it all wrong. The Big Ten was supposed to be the best. The Big 12 next. The Pac-10 was awful. They got it. They got it just upside down. Why? Well, Al James, it's good to be back with you guys. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, we do love March, and one of the reasons we love March is because the so-called experts are always imperfect. I never saw the Pac-12 doing what it did the first weekend. I, I, I thought they might get two teams to the Sweet 16. They got four. The only team that lost was Colorado, which was the highest seeded uh, among their five teams in the tournament, although they did stick around long enough to annihilate your Georgetown Hoyas, Al. But uh, that. the committee, you have to understand something about the committee. This isn't new. The committee is made up of athletic directors and conference commissioners by rule. And once upon a time, there were ex coaches on the committee who'd become athletic directors like Dave Gavitt and Vic Bubis and Terry Holland and Jack Cavance and Les Robinson and others. Now, coaches don't become athletic directors anymore or commissioners. So what you have are a bunch of glorified fundraisers whose knowledge of basketball probably isn't any more than yours, Al. And they sit around with all these statistics. Jeez, that's the nicest thing you've ever said. Thank you. And make decisions without really knowing anything about basketball. Well, uh, you know, this is, I, I love these games. I agree with you totally. But this has really been a strange season. Duke and Kentucky, the bluest of the blue bloods, are not in this. Uh, the Big Ten uh, overrated, the Big 12 overrated, the Pac-12 underrated. How much of this, at least in part, is attributable to the strain season, the COVID-related uh, slowdowns? I'm thinking of a team like Duke and Kentucky rely very heavily on right. freshmen, uh, less time to prepare. Exactly. Uh, is that a factor in all no this? No question. It absolutely is, especially, as you mentioned, Duke and Kentucky – Kentucky was nine and 15. I mean, that's unheard of. Duke was 13 and 11, which is better, but not a heck of a lot better. And because John Calipari and Mike Krzyzewski have become so dependent on freshmen, their summers are very important. Their falls are very important. Their pre-conference schedules are very important to do everything they can to get them up to speed by January when conference play starts. They didn't get to do any of that this year. Duke only played four non-conference games, no summer practices, very few fall practices. 
And you might as well throw into that mix Michigan State, which barely made the tournament and lost to UCLA in the play-in game. North Carolina, which made the tournament and was humiliated by Wisconsin, one of the Big Ten's few good moments. And Kansas, which did play much better toward the end of the regular season and then lost to USC by 34 points. Oh, that's mind-boggling, Kansas losing that way. So it's one of the worst defeats they've ever had. had to John, be. what has there been any particular player or team that you, you didn't think about a week ago and you say, my God, that's that's really impressive. This is really striking. We'll remember this 10 years from well, now. You got to start with Oral Roberts. Uh, right. I, 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 I didn't see Oral Roberts play once during the regular season uh, on TV, certainly not live. Uh, so when they came up as a 15th seed, you kind of go, oh, yeah, they're, they won the Summit League tournament. And so they're, they're in there, and uh, Ohio State will beat them, and that'll be the end of it. Instead, they beat Ohio State in overtime in one of the better games of the tournament so far, uh, and, and then turned around and came from 11 points down to beat Florida in the second round. And they're still, you know, they're on to the Sweet 16. It's a great story. Uh, bear with me for one second, because in 1988, when I was doing my second basketball book, a friend of mine told me that Oral Roberts was a huge basketball fan and used to go into the team locker room before games and give pep talks. So I asked if I could interview him for this book. And they said, sure, come on out. So I was on my way to Tulsa. I stopped. I had to stop in Memphis and I called the, Ken Tricky, the basketball coach. I said, we still good to go. He said, well, there's a little bit of a problem. And I said, what's that? He said, Laurel has gone up in the tower and said, if he doesn't raise $8 million in a week, God is going to call him home. You guys probably remember the story. I do. That was the most, that was without question, yeah. the most unique excuse I ever had for somebody canceling an interview. James Carville. So, so John, I, I follow the bracketologists and everything, and <clears throat> we know the way to feel Look, there was some. I thought we were a little better than eight seed and this and that. But if you'd have had total basketball people that would have been on the selection committee, would, where would it really have differed from what they came out with? Well, in a couple of ways, James. I think, first of all, in some of the seedings. I mean, if you watch, I did watch Loyola play a lot this year. And if you watch Loyola play, there's right. no way they could be an eight seed. There, right. there, that was unfair to Illinois that they were an eight seed. Now, Winthrop did end up losing to Villanova, but they were under at 12. Colgate was under at 14, even though they lost to a very good Arkansas team. But the, the little guys always get the short end of the stick, both in terms of getting into the tournament and in terms of seeding, because even though these guys are supposed to, each of them is assigned three conferences to focus on. And they're supposed, that one person is supposed to be the expert on the Summit League, on the Horizon League, on the, the uh, Missouri Valley, whatever conference it is. And so when the team comes up, they can say, well, these guys are really pretty good, and let me tell you why. Except, as I said before, they don't know basketball. It's one thing to use the eye test, but if the eyes watching the games don't understand the game, that, that doesn't work out too well. I, I always believe, James, that the little guys get the short end of the stick 90% of the time. And part of it is because the, what, it, what do the committee and the networks call one another? Partners. They're partners. So they want television to be happy. That's why, oh, coincidence, Illinois plays Loyola Chicago in the second round. So what happened with the Bucknell-Lehigh series this year? Bucknell-Lehigh? <laughs> you wrote a book about them. They played, they played, they played four times. Because the Patriot League has this crazy schedule where actually Colgate only played five of the other nine teams in the league, for example. I mean, it was, it was, an, it was an insane schedule because a lot of these, a lot of leagues, whether it's the Big Ten or the Patriot League, have commissioners who don't know what the hell they're doing. <laughs> so, so let's assume, because uh, uh, you and Al particularly, but I am too, I love college basketball. And that's, uh, everything is wrong with college basketball. So let's assume we were having lunch at the Palm and I hand you a napkin in, in a big pen. And I said, write down the three things about college basketball that John Feinstein would fix. What would you, what would you put on that napkin? Well, first of all, you got to start paying the players in, in some way, shape or form. 
It, it, and I'm not necessarily saying you pay them every two weeks because there'd be tax implications with their scholarships if you made them out and out employees. But you need to let them make money off their names, images, and likenesses. The NCAA is dragging its feet as best it possibly can. You, you know, the reason you constantly hear the reference to quote student athletes, which by the way is redundant. By rule, you have to be an enrolled student to be a college athlete. It's like calling someone a person man or a person woman. So it's a redundancy, but it's also an hypocrisy used by the NCAA because they want to try to still cast these guys as amateurs. They're not amateurs. They, they got all sorts of privileges in which they, they need in order to have any chance to survive academically. But, and, and the top ones at the top schools, they're preparing to play in the NBA. And what's wrong with that? When I was in college, I was preparing to, to be a sports writer. Well, and, and if the Washington Post had offered me the chance to work there after my sophomore year, I'd have gone. You know, the, the idea of criticizing players for coming out early to make millions of dollars is ridiculous. So the, the first thing I do is I, I would find a way for the players to share in the billions of dollars that they're making off the tournament. The only reason they're having a tournament this year, guys, is because they lost $450 million in TV revenue last year and they weren't going to lose it again. The, the second thing I would do is I would, I would change the way the game is played in the sense that every game we watch in this tournament has 10 two and a half minute timeouts, TV timeouts, and a 20 minute halftime. How does the game have any rhythm that way? I always say the NCAA tournament is so good that even the NCAA can't screw it up. Because in spite of all that, we sit there and we watch it. And the third thing is, you know, 70% of the kids playing Division I college basketball are, are African American. And it's worse in the NFL, it's worse in college football, but still under 30% of the head coaches are black. And there, there should be more opportunity. And most of the opportunities, and this is again true in the NFL, college football, and, and, and Major League Baseball is different because there are so few blacks playing nowadays, but, but most of the opportunities go to, uh, are, that black coaches get are at programs that are in, in, in disaster mode. The, the notable exception to that was when Tubby Smith went to Kentucky in 1997 and won the national championship his first year. So, okay, how, you know, everybody wants to pay them, everybody image and likeness. Of course, if you're the, the number three starter at, at Bucknell, no one is going to buy your image and likeness. You know, that's absolutely and, right. You know, and so how do you execute paying? Do you pay minimum wage? <clears throat> do you pay the starting five more than you pay the reserves? No, because so, but name, image, image, and likeness, James, isn't the schools paying? It's you paying someone to come in and and speak at at at, at, a, at a convention or at you know the way you you guys get paid. I get paid occasionally to to speak to uh, clients of a corporation or whatever it might sure. be. The, you know, in, in Alabama right now, the starting five for the Crimson Tide would be in high demand. They'd be in demand to sell cars. They'd be in demand to, to speak. They'd be in demand to do autograph signings. And they get paid whatever the market will bear. Okay. And, and, and you're right about Bucknell. So, but the kids at Bucknell aren't making much, billions of right. dollars for Bucknell. But, but wouldn't that just make everybody want to go to big wealthy universities with a big following well they already do okay they already do all right, all right I, I just... those schools still already have the advantages because they're on tv more they have bigger recruiting budgets they 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 can tell their their players you're going to play in twenty thousand seat arenas right the, the advantages are already there right but but if the alabama business hey, council hey john it's with great reservation that i praise the ncaa because i think it's a racket but they really it appears did have, have so far done a very good job with that bubble in Indianapolis. And then they screwed it up. They offset it by the way they, they um, uh, treated the women's tournament. Well, uh, I suppose here's we the shouldn't thing expect that, anything Al. differently, the, but they the, really did. As I said before, the men's tournament is the cash cow for the NCAA. So I don't know, I, I can't put a number on it, but let's say 80%, 85, 90% of their focus since last summer, when they trademarked the phrase battle in the bubble in preparing for this, 
has been on being able to carry out the men's tournament because the men's tournament is where they make their money. The women's basketball, which has come a long way to go back to that old Virginia Slims commercial in 20, 25 years in terms of the quality of play is still not a moneymaker. So as they were preparing for these two tournaments, I promise you the number of people working on the men's tournament from the NCAA was probably triple or quadruple the number of people working on the women's tournament, which is why, what was the phrase they used? We, we, we didn't get it right or whatever it was, they sure as heck didn't get it right because they weren't paying attention. Hey, John, uh, we, I mean, John Thompson's uh, posthumous uh, memoir, he said, cheating is everywhere. Everybody, you know, it's, he said, if I were back coaching again, I'd cheat because you have to. How widespread is, is cheating in college basketball? You know, Al, I, I mean, I remember John telling me years ago that when he was a high school coach, he recruited uh, at St. Anthony's, which was against the rules. And he said that he told the players he was recruiting, you might as well come play for me because I'll admit I recruited you unlike other high school coaches who would say, oh, no, I never recruited. I never recruit anybody. Um, and John was always honest that way. I, I, I don't think it's as widespread as some people would want you to believe because it's the old cheaters cop out. Everybody does it. Not everybody does it, but a lot of, a lot of teams do it. A lot of coaches do it. Uh, and, and, you know, the reason, cheating pays. That's the problem. R Rick Patino will always get another job because why? He wins. See, he wins. Losing Doesn't matter if is he a cheats. much John, if you remember, you told us a story one time about John Thompson and a coach's confab with, I don't know, the Liberty coach or it someone was, like it, that. Do you remember Richie the story? McKay, yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and it, they, they had a come to Jesus coaches meeting after the year when, when, when Dave Bliss, one of the Baylor players got killed and Dave Bliss told his players to lie about it when law enforcement came in. And there was all sorts of accusations of cheating going on as always. So they brought all the coaches to Chicago and John Thompson was retired. This was in 2006. And they brought John in as, you know, someone who had been, who was in, in the hall of fame and could speak to all sorts of issues. And Richie McKay, who's done a great job at Liberty, by the way, was at Oregon state at the time. And he stood up and he said, coach Thompson, don't you think the most important thing we can do right now as coaches is to have a closer relationship with Jesus Christ. And John, being John, looked out and said, I think the most important y'all blanks could do right now is to stop cheating all the time. You can say the blank on a podcast. I can? <laughs> yeah, but I can't say it as well as John said it. John once John, John once during a question, speech used you have his to tell me words when. so many times. It was a, it was like a black Who tie audience. The... He was getting the Dean Smith Award. And, and you can see all these people kind of going, oh, my God, oh, my God. And John finally turned to me. I was sitting right near the podium. And he said, John, these people don't understand. I speak two languages, English and profanity. So, so John, we have John, to. John, let me just ask you a final question, James. You don't have to tell me when. Who will be the next Duke basketball coach? I don't know. And I don't think Mike Krzyzewski knows. Um, I, I, I think Mike's going to coach one more year. That's a guess. It's pure speculation. He'll be 75. He wouldn't want to quit on this season. Uh, he could have a good team next year. Give him an opportunity to walk away feeling good about his last season. Uh, but I, I, I think if he, if he wants, I think he wants the next coach to be black. Duke has never had a black coach in either football or basketball. So it's way past time. So Tommy Amaker, who's done an amazing job at Harvard, has to be in the conversation. Johnny Dawkins, who almost beat Duke two years ago at UCF, has to be in the conversation, his first great backcourt. I think Jeff Capel, if he can get it going a little bit at Pittsburgh, he had a bad season this year, lost a bunch of players to transfer, would be in the conversation. Um, and, and I think John Shire and Nate James, who are both on the staff right now, would be in the conversation. If he goes outside the family, it, uh, he, he's not gonna get Brad Stevens, who I'd love to see him get. He might get Shaka Smart, whose star is dimmed a little bit at Texas, or he might get go after a guy like Porter Moser, who's done such amazing work at Loyola. Boy, he sure has. James Carville? So we had the NCAA tournament, you know, I think it was 2013, and I was on you know, some bullshit committee. And I was talking to him. I said, what I think you guys ought to do is you talk to Wayne in the men's tournament. 
you should have them in the same city. So the women would play the semifinals on Thursday and the finals on Saturday. The men would do the Friday-Sunday thing. However you wanted to work it out. All the press would be there. Everything would be in one place. You'd actually do something not really objective. You would save, you'd joint the thing, get a network to carry both of them. And, oh, you don't know if you can do that. It's institutionally kind of difficult to coach a women's basketball and men's basketball well, to me, I've, no one's ever given me a convincing idea of why that wouldn't be good for basketball fans in general and would be really good for women's basketball. Well, let me start with a logistical problem. I'm not sure there's a, a city in the country other than maybe New York or L.A. that, that has enough hotel rooms to, to have the final four for the men and the women at the same time with the fan, all the fans that come for it. But the more important point, James, if, if I'm the women, I don't want to share a city with the men. I don't want to be considered the, you know, the second class final four in that city. The other thing is, if you, what, if you hold the women's games in the football stadium, you're not going to sell it out. You know, just not. You know, women's basketball is just not as big as men's basketball. It's, it's just not. we got to get over it. So it, the point is, you would elevate – the idea behind it is actually to elevate women's basketball. But well, I'm not you sure would every but in, there are plenty of places. Look, there are plenty of places where have a half a million people, a million people come to Mardi Gras. All right, you can uh, if you did it in the Smoothie King and you did it there, you have fifty thousand people that somebody could figure something out. But the idea that there's parity between women's basketball and men's basketball is just nonsense and it's never going to be. But the one thing you would do by doing that is you would bring a lot of attention to women's basketball because every reporter, every TV thing, every interviewer, everybody would be in the same place. I, it might be a little difficult. I think it would be good across the board for college basketball. Well, I, I hear what you're saying and, and you're right. You would have all the media there in the same city. Uh, but it, I just think logistically it would be difficult. Again, I don't know anything about logistics. I can barely get right. my family out right. to dinner. Right. But, but I, I, I also think it's better for the women to have the spotlight to themselves in a different city. And they do get plenty of media coverage nowadays. All right. Well, and they have their own TV well, network. ESPN televises every game. Right. John Feinstein, before you go, you want to you wanna pick a winner? Will Gonzaga no. run the uh, run streak? No, I hope Gonzaga wins. I hope they do. I think it'd be a great, I, they're a wonderful team to watch. I don't know how much chance you guys have had to see them. Um, and, and it's it, the fact that Jalen Suggs, who could have gone to any power school, picked Gonzaga, tells you how far Mark Few has brought the program, not just in terms of winning games, but in terms of he can recruit right now against Krzyzewski, against Calipari, against Roy Williams, against Bill Self, anybody else you want to name. And that's why they are so good. And anybody who thinks because they're in the WCC that they're not as good as these other teams is crazy. <laughs> and I would love to see him go undefeated and win the national championship because Mark is a terrific guy and a great coach and it'd be a heck of a story. So you're following the, the Andy Byer rule. Andy knows about horse racing. Anybody else could never pick a derby one. He just quit. <laughs> I never tried. I never tried. You, you never tried. You know, I, but... think the, I, think my, I think my last correct prognostication was Nixon over McGovern. <laughs> I'll tell you this, you, I, I may not pick a, you, you, you may not pick a winner, but you sure write like a winner. John Feinstein, terrific to have you on. Uh, be safe, and uh, let's enjoy the next two weeks. Al, James, thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. All right. Terrific. The smaller the ball, the better the book. <laughs> Hey, thanks for listening to Politics War Room with James Carville, and I'm Al Hunt. Don't forget to send your questions for us by email to politicswarroom at gmail.com or tweet them for next week's show at Politicon, when we'll be joined next week by author and historian Gary Wills, maybe the most prominent public intellectual in America. Following this episode, we really would appreciate you check out the links to our sponsors in the show notes each week. We deeply thank you for supporting them. When you do, you help make this podcast happen. To keep up with us, subscribe to Politics War Room on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. Please rate the show with a five-star review. We'll be back next week with another show as we continue our War Room planning.